1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. Well, let's go to the God of the Word uh, before we look at His Scriptures. God, we are overwhelmed with our salvation. Triune God and eternity past, you destined a day when Christ, you would hang upon the shameful cross for our sins. Overwhelms us to consider that. Our iniquities separated us from you, God. Your word says that, that our sins caused you to hide your face from us. We confess that we don't know, we don't grasp the gravity of our, our sins. We don't understand how offensive our sin is to you. You are holy, holy, holy. Christ, you left the indescribable glories of heaven. You left the fellowship you shared with the triune Godhead. Christ, you, you lived a, a perfect life. Then in the greatest injustice of all history, Christ, you voluntarily allowed wicked men to crucify you. But ultimately, Lord Jesus, it was the hand of your heavenly Father that, that crushed you, that put our sins upon you. And because of that, your heavenly Father poured out his wrath upon you. It was our sin. It was my sin that you bore on the cross. It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming to consider our sin, all of our sins. Jesus, who but you could bear wrath so great and justice fair? And so our hearts, they overflow in singing now and for all eternity. Alleluia, alleluia, Lamb of God for sinners slain. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise your name. Alleluia. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. What is the center of Christianity? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 2, the Apostle Paul says, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ, and Him crucified. Beloved, Christ's victorious death is the foundation for your entire Christian life. But we get so easily distracted by a a myriad of lesser things. When the Apostle Peter first wrote this epistle, he knew that his readers were going through persecution. They were going through great difficulty. They were going through suffering. But what would most encourage them? What is it that will most encourage you? Christ's victorious death in your place gives you the perspective that you need to go through any circumstance, any suffering, any struggle in life. And that's what 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 18 through 22 is all about. Because this passage will give you a renewed view of Christ's death for you. Peter will help you to grasp the power that is displayed in the crucifixion of Christ for you. We will see in this passage, the central point of this passage, is that through Christ's victorious death, draw near to God. A call to every believer that you would draw near to God through Christ's victorious death. We will see two main things in this passage. First of all, we will see a sufficient sacrifice. And then we will see a complete conquest. Now even though in this passage there are several very difficult interpretive issues, my goal is to continue to emphasize what Peter emphasizes. To focus on what Peter focuses on. And that is the victorious death of Christ. No matter where you are or what situation you find yourself in this morning, this passage has a message for you. Maybe it's a crisis in your family with a child or or with parents or with a a spouse. Maybe there's a a crisis in your employment or or finances or, or difficulty that you're going through in that way. Maybe there's a crisis in relationships. Maybe a particular relationship just seems to be flying apart. 
Maybe you're having a, a crisis in conquering sin. That again and again, maybe for a long time, you continue to struggle with the same sin again and again. No matter what the crisis is that you are facing, a renewed understanding of Christ's death for you is the perspective that you must have. Because that is the foundation for you to see what God declares is most important in your life. Let's look at 1 Peter 3, 18-22. The Word of God says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that He might bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. And corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. This passage is a call to each one of us that through Christ's victorious death, we would draw near to God. First of all, let's look at a sufficient sacrifice. Look there in verse 18. One of the most profound descriptions of what Christ's death does for the person that comes to him in faith. Verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Beloved, the the sacrificial death of Christ is central to Christianity. It is the foundation of your faith. It is the cornerstone of every conviction. It is the bedrock of every belief that we cling to. What is the, the death of Christ? This is what has been called penal substitutionary atonement. I know it's a big phrase. And you say, John, why bring out that big phrase? Because it's a crucial truth. And every aspect is important. Why is it penal? It's because there was, a, there was a penalty. There was a penalty that we owed because of our sin. Substitutionary. Christ was our substitute. He took our place. He suffered the penalty we deserved. And in all that atonement, His death was the atonement for our sins that the holiness of God required. It's penal substitutionary atonement. It is the center of what it means to be a true Christian. Isaiah 53, 6 probably probably says it the best. The prophet Isaiah, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each of us to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. In an amazing way, in order to satisfy his righteous wrath, God put our sin on his son on the cross, who voluntarily died in our place. The Apostle Paul says the same thing in 2 Corinthians 5.21, when he says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. This is often called the the great exchange. Our sin, horrible as it is, our sin in exchange for Christ's righteousness. We tend to be so familiar with these Deep truths that often we fail to appreciate their eternal significance. Even as we sing them, these truths can roll off our lips and yet our minds are not overwhelmed with what we are singing. British pastor 
British pastor John Stott has said, quote, Every time we look at the cross, Christ seems to say to us, I am here because of you. It is your sin I am bearing, your curse I am suffering, your debt I am paying, your death I am dying. Stott continues, nothing in history or in the universe cuts us down to size like the cross. All of us have inflated views of ourselves, especially in self-righteousness, until we visited a place called Calvary. It's there at the foot of the cross that we shrink to our true size, unquote. Beloved, for all of us, it's at the foot of the cross that our our pride is revealed, our self-righteousness is revealed, and we are overwhelmed, overwhelmed with the greatness of Christ's sacrifice in our place instead of us. Notice what Peter says. He says, Christ also died for sins once, For all, one sacrifice for all who would ever believe. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know that there had to be a constant sacrifice of animals again and again. It was never over because every Old Testament sacrifice pointed ahead to the once for all sacrifice of Christ that satisfied the penalty that our sin deserved. In John John 19.30, Christ said, It is finished. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Be very thoughtful about what Christ says. Precise. Jesus did not say, I am finished. Not at all. That's not what he was saying. He was saying, it is finished. What is the it? The suffering, the penal substitutionary atonement in your place. If you're a Christian, Christ is saying that he had finished, completed. He had satisfied the wrath of God that your sin deserved. So Christ's sacrifice, Christ's death was was not a defeat. No, it was the victory. It was the victory. It was the once for all sacrifice that atoned for sin. It is finished. It is done. No more sacrifice. It was over. The Father's wrath was satisfied. And it was confirmed in Christ's resurrection. When the Protestant reformers understood this, they realized that the true Christians cannot participate in the Roman Catholic Mass. Why? Because the whole point of the Mass is that Christ is sacrificed again and again. And Scripture declares it's, it's once for all. It's a complete, finished sacrifice. Peter continues in verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. In other words, the just suffered the wrath of God in the place of the unjust, the suffering that the unjust deserved. Now some would say, well, God is so merciful. God is so loving that he forgives sin without demanding any justice. There would some that would say, some even that want to claim to be Christians, they would say there is no penal substitutionary atonement. We sing a a very well-loved contemporary hymn called In Christ Alone. And in that hymn it states, Till on the cross as Jesus died, The wrath of God was satisfied. There was a large Christian denomination several years ago. 10,000 churches, 1.7 million members. And that denomination, they wanted to include that song in Christ alone in their hymn book. But they wanted to change the words. Because they didn't agree with the words. They wanted to change the words to say, Till on that cross... As Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. Now Keith Getty and Stuart Townend, who were authors of that song, they they said no, graciously, but, but firmly, no. You cannot change those words. 
Because Christ's satisfaction of the wrath of God in our place is central to true Christianity. Beloved, the love of God was magnified because the wrath of God was satisfied. Because without the wrath of God being satisfied, there is no magnification of God's love. The glory of the cross is that God is both just, holy, righteous, and the justifier, loving, gracious, merciful. The mystery of the cross is that that all the magnificent attributes of God are displayed. And for that we say, sing, alleluia, praise the Lord. That's why we sing. That's why our hearts are overwhelmed with emotion when we consider what Christ has done for us. And to water down what Christ has done for us leaves us nothing to sing about. We praise Him that He was our substitute. He took the penalty when He atoned for our sins. But why? Why? Why all of that? Why did Christ die on the cross for you? Why did he take the penalty that you deserved? Why was he a willing substitute? Why was he the atonement for you? Why was it just to rescue you from hell? Was it just to get you to heaven? Was it to maybe just give you purpose in life? Why the cross? Why? It tells you in this verse. Look at verse 18 again. For Christ also died for sins once for all. The just for the unjust. And here's the why. In order that he might bring us to God. Beloved, Christ was voluntarily sacrificed in your place to restore your broken relationship with God. That's the why. For God's glory, He determined that you would be restored to fellowship with Him. It's very easy to lose sight of the the true blessing of salvation, to get wrapped up in in other very wonderful but side blessings of salvation when this is what brings God glory is when His enemies are reconciled to Him and become His friends. John 17 verse 3 tells us what eternal life is. And this is eternal life. What is it? That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That is eternal life. Knowing, and that's not just an intellectual knowledge. The word used there for know in John 17 is a a, a knowledge of relationship, a communion with God. Heaven is not the greatest benefit of salvation. As glorious as that will be, the greatest benefit of salvation is that you have a personal relationship with the God of the universe both now and forever. Pastor John Piper has said, quote, Christ did not die to forgive sinners who go on treasuring anything, anything above seeing and savoring God. And people who would be happy in heaven, if Christ were not there, will not be there. The gospel is not a way to get people to heaven. It is a way to get people to God, unquote. That is so crucial. The gospel In other words, the good news of Christ dying in the place of wicked sinners, the gospel is a way to get you to God, to reconcile your relationship with Him. So Christian, do you revel in your relationship with God? Does it overwhelm you with delight and joy? Beloved, God's Word declares again, And again and again that through Christ's work on the cross, you have open and free access to God. Ephesians Ephesians 3.12 says, In whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in Him. Hebrews 4.16 says, 
Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 10.22 says, Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Christian, you are invited. Actually, more strongly, you are commanded to come boldly, boldly into the very presence of the God of the universe. Consider that deeply, deeply. What happened when when Christ died? In a very symbolic way, the the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. That great curtain was torn to show what? That now through Christ's death, there is open access. No need anymore for the blood of bulls and goats. No need for any of that because Christ had become the once for all sacrifice so that all who would come to faith in Him could have bold and confident access to Him. It's not because of what you've done. It's not because of who you are. It's through faith that you have been brought into union with Christ. A oneness in Christ. When you come to Him in faith, you are one with Him. And because you are one with Christ, you have been forgiven every sin you would ever commit. And... In a positive sense, His righteousness has been put on you so that when God the Father sees you, what does He see? He doesn't see the sin that you just committed. He doesn't see the sins of this past week or this past year. What does God the Father see when He looks at you if you're His child? He sees only one thing. He sees His Son. He sees the righteousness of His Son that is upon you. And that's why when you and I, when we struggle to have bold confidence to come before the presence of God, it's because we've forgotten who we are in Christ. Our sins have all been forgiven. We have His righteousness upon us. Ponder that. Consider that. Live your life in light of that. Let your mind be dominated By what God's word declares about you, that you are forgiven and you are as righteous as Christ is. But how is that accomplished? How is our relationship with Christ accomplished? Look at the end of verse 18. What was it that that brought you near to God? Peter says at the end of verse 18, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Christ died. Zach reflected on that earlier. Christ died. And Christ's physical death, in a sense, was the, was the culmination. It was the culmination of His suffering. Christ physically died. He became a man so that He could suffer and die. Christ was no mere phantom who only appeared to have a human body. No, He became a human. He became a man. Beloved, Christ physically died. The Roman soldiers, they were professional executioners. They would never have let someone just faint. And in this verse here, at the end of verse 18, there's a clear contrast between flesh and spirit. He's not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about Christ's Spirit. Since flesh is a reference to Christ's physical body, then Spirit must be a reference to His Spirit, not the Holy Spirit. He was made alive in the Spirit. How, what, how did that happen? Well, in Luke 23, 46, it says, And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, here it is, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. So when Christ was made alive in the spirit, he entrusted his spirit to God. He physically died and then he entered into fellowship with God again since the penalty had been completely and finally paid. It is finished. His death 
was the culmination, the completion of his suffering. There are great implications from this verse. Great implications. Beloved, you must have confidence in your standing before God. Confidence. Now, you may read this passage and this may not be talking about you because you have never come to Christ in faith and repentance. Christ said when he was on this earth, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. When he's talking about weary there, he, he's not talking about the tiredness of all the many demands and expectations and uh, difficulties of life. No, he's talking about something far more important. Who needs to come to Christ? Those who, are, those who are weary in soul. Weary of trying through their own self-righteousness to earn their way to God. For some who are listening to this, the call of this passage for you is to, to come to Christ in faith and repentance. And what can happen? What does this first promise will happen if you come to Christ in faith? This passage says that you will be brought near to God. Without that, you were destined not just for hell. You were destined for a Christless eternity, eternally separated from God. And so the call of the gospel for you is to, to come to God. Come to God. Believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Not sins in general. Your sins. To believe He died on the cross for your sins. To repent of your sins. And to follow Him as Lord and Master of your life. Come to Christ. Don't put it off another day. Come to Christ. You are weary. You know you're weary. You're weary. You're wearing yourself out. Trying to make it look like you're a Christian. Trying to convince the other people around you that you're a Christian. Even more importantly, trying to convince yourself that you're a Christian. And yet if you don't know Christ, you will be weary until you bow the knee to Christ. Come to Christ. But... If you do know Christ, then you must have an unshakable confidence in your standing before God. Some who are listening to what I just said, it's affecting you. And yet you're a true Christian, and yet you're beginning to have doubts. And yet you, are, you have come to Christ in faith and repentance. Well, acknowledge that this passage declares that not what you do, but what Christ has done is where your security is. So often Christians focus on what they do rather than what Christ has done. And as they fall into sin, it causes great fluctuation. It causes great doubt. Beloved, whenever you sin, it's a crisis because it's an opportunity to remind yourself of Christ's death in your place. And let a remembrance of Christ's death in your place, let that overshadow all your doubt. Let that overshadow all your fear and despair. So many Christians needlessly carry around with them a black cloud of guilt. Beloved, run to the cross for repentance. Run to the cross for forgiveness. Run to the cross to experience a renewed confirmation of your position with God again and again. You say, what do I mean, run to the cross? I mean, Consider again what Peter has just said to us in these passage, this passage. It's not just saying the word cross, cross, cross again in your mind or gospel, gospel, gospel. It's reflecting on truth like this. Jesus did this. Jesus was the substitute in my place. Jesus bore my sin. And not just in general, Jesus bore that sin. That's what it means to run to the cross. To reflect again on what Christ has done for you. Remind yourself again. Don't assume that. Remind yourself again and again of what Christ has done for you. And then, beloved, boldly press into communion with God. Boldly. Your position in Christ is crucial. But there's something deeply wrong if your position in Christ doesn't flow out into an intimate relationship of love and affection. It would be like a, a legal marriage where there was no intimacy, no communion, no affection, no love. Christian, God saved you for communion, for fellowship. Now, I, I realize it's hard. It's difficult as we live, as we battle with our sinful flesh and all these things that are pulling at us. I realize that, that it's difficult. It's hard. 
It will never be perfect in this life. And don't think that every other Christian is doing great in their relationship with God, but only you struggle. No, we all struggle. It's a battle. Like any, any relationship, it takes effort. But that's why we need to spend time with God and His Word every day. Not just in case someone asks us if we did. Not at all. It's so that we can grow in fellowship and communion with God. Go to His Word to know God. Commune with God. Grow in your affection and love for Him. It's not easy. There will be seasons of dryness. Your walk with God, your fellowship with God will will never fully be what you want it to be in this life. And yet, beloved, refuse to give up. Say, I'm not going to give up because I believe what God says in His Word here that Christ died so that I could be brought near to God. Cry out to God in humble brokenness again and again. Oh God, grow me. Grow me in my love and my intimacy with you. Because that is why you died for me, Christ. Cry out again and again. And to believe by faith over time, He will grow you as you pursue your relationship with Him. Press deeply into your relationship with Christ. Through Christ's victorious death, draw near to God. So we've seen a a sufficient sacrifice. An all-sufficient sacrifice. That's the center of this passage. The thrust of this passage is verse 18. It's a sufficient sacrifice. And now in the remainder of the passage, verses 19 to 22, Peter is going to give us more of a broad range to see the, the amazing effect how Christ's death was a complete conquest. Look at verses 19 to 20. Peter says, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Like a mountain-moving earthquake, Christ's victorious death had far-reaching implications. It had a ripple effect into the entire universe in all aspects of reality. The first one we see here is that the cross rocked the angelic world. You notice he uses the word spirit there. And throughout the New Testament, whenever the word spirit, the term spirit is used generically like it's used here. It almost always refers to angelic beings. But in this passage, Peter's talking about a particular group of angelic beings. He's talking about disobedient spirits. In other words, fallen angels or sometimes called demons. And you know that if Christ continually confronted demons during his earthly ministry, all over the place we see it. Luke 4, 36 It says, with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits. Same word. And they come out. We as well struggle spiritually with demonic forces. 1 Peter 5.8. Later on in this very book, Peter will say, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil. Satan is an evil spirit, a demon. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So, then what is this particular group of angels that Peter says are are confined or in, in prison? When Satan and most of his angels, they are free to do their work under God's sovereign authority. Well, Peter's talking a particular group of demons where they're confined and This is no earthly confinement. They are in hell. Peter is describing a particular group of angels who are not free to do their wicked work. They're not free to to go all over the earth. They're confined. Because these particular demons, they not only rebelled against God at Satan's fall, they also committed a particularly heinous sin during the time of Noah. Genesis chapter 6 actually paints a picture of of rampant wickedness and immorality that was over the whole earth prior to the flood. 
And in a way that we don't fully understand, a number of these wicked angels, demons, they became directly involved in immorality on the earth. And so God intervened in a direct way and he immediately bound these demons in hell. And he's holding them there until their time of final judgment. Peter talks about this same group in 2 Peter 2, 4 to 5. Where it says, for if God did not spur angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. That's not all the angels because most of, it's not all the demons because most of the the demons are, are free to do their work. But there's a group of them that have been cast into hell that are committed to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. They're waiting to that final time when they're thrown at the lake of fire. What What happened? What is Peter talking about here in 1 Peter 3.19? Peter says that Christ went and he made proclamation to these spirits in prison, these demons that were imprisoned. Think about it. At the point of the cross, the demons were probably celebrating their apparent victory of Christ. Because we know Satan had been directly involved in, with Judas and, and he was directly behind the, the crucifixion of Christ on the cross. He has no idea that what he thinks is victory will be his true and ultimate defeat. But the, end, the demons would have been gravely disappointed, gravely disappointed when Christ showed up and proclaimed victory. When Christ went to them and proclaimed victory. But very importantly, this is crucial. Christ did not go to hell to suffer for your sin. It's not what it's talking about at all. Christ owed Satan nothing. He suffered before the hand of God, his Father. He suffered the wrath of God. The entirety of his suffering for sin occurred on the cross. He completely satisfied the wrath of God on the cross. What did Christ say at the end of his crucifixion? He said, it is finished. And then he died. Meaning what? His suffering for sin was over. There was nothing more to suffer. So why did he go to hell like it says here in 1 Peter 3.19? Well, to proclaim. Now the word here for proclaim... It's a different Greek word than the word that's used for preaching the good news. It's different because Christ didn't descend into hell and and preach the gospel to the fallen demons. Not at all. This is a proclamation, an official declaration where he proclaimed his victory over Satan. He proclaimed his victory over them. Colossians 2.15 refers to the same thing. Situation when it says, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, how did he disarm them? The cross. After the cross, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. When Christ proclaimed his victory to the demons, he was at the same time declaring the salvation of lost sinners. What an encouragement this would have been to Peter's audience. Think about it. Because no doubt in their suffering and in their persecution, they would have felt the brunt of much evil and persecution. And what an encouragement to know that Christ had already conquered the forces that were behind much, or if not all, of their persecution. The serpent and his evil forces had been conquered. He was done. He was dead. It was over. Now he's still thrashing around, but he has been defeated. I remember one time when I was a, a boy, I was cutting some weeds with a, a little weed whacker thing, and all of a sudden I heard a telltale whirring behind me. And I jumped back as fast as I could, and behind me there was a rattlesnake that was coiled, and it was just ready to strike. I am, scrambled to safety. I immediately yelled as loud as I could, Dad, there's a snake. My dad came running with a shovel. He cut off the head snake with that shovel. And yet an amazing thing happened. Even with its head completely severed, that snake for quite a while continued to writhe, continued to thrash around. It's similar with Satan and his evil forces. Christ has defeated him at the cross completely, but he's still thrashing around and raising lots of havoc. But as a Christian, we know 
that he has been beheaded. We know that he has been completely defeated. We know that we have nothing to fear from him because he has been conquered through the cross. Death, sin, and Satan have been conquered. Peter continues in verse 20. Who once were disobedient, these evil angels, demons, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. And I believe this in verse 20, this is more than just gives us a context to know. It does help us to understand who these, uh, these demons are and what happened to them. But it's more than that. Far more than that. Why? Because this is a picture of your salvation. Noah and his family are a vivid illustration of salvation out of the entire population of the world. How many were saved when the flood came? Only eight. Eight. We don't know exactly how many were alive in the, in the world at that time, but all of them, 100%, were destroyed except for Noah and the members of his immediate family. Noah believed God, Hebrews 11 says. He believed God and he was rescued just like Peter's readers are re- were rescued through faith and just like we are rescued through faith when we trust in Christ's victorious death for us. What a great picture of salvation. So when you read in Genesis 6 to 11, when you read the story of, of Noah and the ark, it's a wonderful picture of what happens to us at salvation. Peter continues in verse 21. And corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now I realize that this is a difficult overall, this whole passage. Martin Luther actually considered this the most difficult passage, 1 Peter 3, 18, 22, in the whole New Testament. And so there's a lot of difficult issues in this passage, and yet it all reinforces the central truth of Christ's victorious death. Now, what does he mean when he says baptism now saves you? Well, we, we know that Peter doesn't mean that we're saved eternally because someone is physically baptized in water. Ephesians 2.8 says we are saved by faith through, by grace through faith. There, there's no human work. There's no human act. No human ceremony can save. A person that is baptized with water, they're no more saved than they were before. What is baptism? Baptism is an external act of obedience that demonstrates an inner transformation of heart. A conscience that has been completely changed. But without the inner transformation, then no act of baptism, water baptism has any significance. Not at all. And Peter makes that clear in the the remaining phrases there in verse 21. He he tells you that that's not what he's talking about. When he says it's not the removal of dirt from the flesh as if a a water baptism, but it's an appeal to God for a a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A cleansed conscience could never come through a a mere uh, ceremony of water. A cleansed conscience only comes through the transforming work of Christ's death on our behalf. We have been made new creations in Christ. Our consciences have been cleansed. And what what is the cleansing of our conscience directly connected to? What does he say here at the end of verse 21? It's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So your being cleansed is through Christ's resurrection. Why? Because the resurrection verified that God had accepted Christ's death in your place. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection declared that, Christ, that God the Father had accepted Christ's sacrifice on your behalf. So the, the whole idea and the effectiveness of of baptism is dependent on the resurrection of Christ. It's the grace of the risen Lord which cleanses us. Then at the the last verse there in verse of chapter 3, verse 22, Peter draws this full circle. Look at verse 22. Who, Christ, is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers 
have been subjected to him. What an encouragement this would have been to Peter's audience. Because what's it saying? It's saying, in a sense, look past Look past what seem to be defeats on a human level. Look past to where it seems that the enemies of Christ seem to be winning. They're persecuting. They're even putting to death because we know historically it's only going to get worse for Peter's readers. Look past that. Look past that to Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of God. When we go through persecution, when we, un- when we have great difficulty in our lives, when we go through great suffering, when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we must look past all those circumstances. We must look to Christ who is seated at the right hand of God. He is there at God's right hand, the, the preeminent place of honor and authority. He is there in glory, governing the universe with His heavenly Father. He is there as our incarnate Lord. He is exalted and He is ever able to come to the aid of His suffering saints. He is there at the right hand of His Father, interceding for you and me continually. Christ is there on your behalf for the glory of God. Romans 8.34 read earlier says who is the one who condemns christ jesus is he who died yes rather who is raised who's at the right hand of god who also intercedes for us doesn't matter if people condemn it doesn't matter if people persecute it doesn't matter if people condemn you to death because christ is at the right hand of god interceding for you It even doesn't matter the sins that you struggle with because if you're a Christian, then Christ intercedes for that very sin. And he says, I died for that sin. That woman, that man, that young person, that boy, that girl, they are my child and I died for that sin. Beloved, Christ right now is at the right hand of his father interceding for you. So we, we have a, an all-sufficient sacrifice. We have seen a complete conquest. And I trust that this gives you, in, 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 in one way, overwhelming. I trust you're overwhelmed. I trust that you're overwhelmed. One, that you can't fully grasp it. And you say, I don't fully grasp all that. Yes, we don't fully grasp that. That's the mystery of the cross. And yet that you're also overwhelmed with thankfulness for what Christ has done for you. His victorious death on your behalf. For all of us, are you truly thankful for Christ's sufficient sacrifice that has brought you into fellowship, into communion both now and forever with the God of the universe? That must bring perspective to every struggle, every difficulty, every failure, every sin. It must bring perspective when you are overwhelmed with what Christ has done for you. He died in your place so that you could be reconciled to God. The 1550s were a very difficult time to be a Christian in England. Edward VI had just died and his sister Mary, called Bloody Mary for a reason, she had come to the throne and she was wreaking havoc on true followers of Christ. In 1553 in London, a 19-year-old young man named William, William Hunter, he was arrested for the simple act of reading a copy of God's word in the English language. Something that I trust all of you have done this week. He was arrested for that. He was given many opportunities to recant, but he refused. He was in prison for about a year and a half. And then on March 26, 1555, he was led to a place in London known as Burntwood. He was chained to a pole. And then a scene unfolds which is hard, hard to imagine. His believing father spoke words of comfort to him. 21-year-old William said to his father, God be with you, good father, and be of good comfort when we shall all meet again. When the fires were lit at his feet, William's father urged him to think on the cross of Jesus. 
Think about Christ on the cross and to not be afraid. And as the flames began to lick at his feet, William said, I am not afraid. I am not afraid. I am not afraid. And then he quote, quoted the words of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, who said, Lord, into your hands receive my spirit. How could this young man have such courage? How could he have such peace when he was in the place of great torment, great trouble, great difficulty? Why? He was following his father's words. He was thinking on the cross. He was meditating on what Christ had done for him. He was meditating on the reality that Christ's death had brought him into communion with God. Because prior to being burned, earlier in the day, William quoted Psalm 84 and his longing for God's presence. He said, How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs and even yearns for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house and the swallow a nest for yourself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, how blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. That's why he could have peace. Because he knew that Jesus Christ had died on the cross so that he could be reconciled both now and forever with the God of the universe. Does your soul long and yearn for the presence of God? That's what the cross beckons to you. So, beloved, through Christ's victorious death, draw near to God again and again and again. Let's pray. Talk to the Lord. How how does this passage beckon you to refresh your communion with God, to remind you again of why Christ saved you? Talk to the Lord and and renew again. Cry out to Him and cry out to Him for grace that you would be able to draw near in communion and fellowship to God through Christ's death. Lord Jesus, may we be those who believe what your word says. And when doubts assail and when fear is overwhelmed, that we remind ourselves again of of what your word declares, that we have been reconciled to God through your death, Christ. And that that would give us perspective, that it would drive us away from sin, but also that when we do sin, that it would drive us to your, to the foot of the cross so that we can find mercy and help in time of need. And then we could not just have a feeling of being forgiven, but far more importantly, that we may be driven to deeper and more fresh communion with God. That's our prayer. We need your grace to do that. And we believe by faith that you will provide it as we come to you again and again. In your name we pray, amen.